Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Shaw Prize Lecture of Life Sciences and Medicine 2023. I'm Uma, a final year PhD student of cancer biology here at the Hong Kong University Faculty of Medicine. Now today, we are most delighted to have this year's Shaw Laureates in Life Sciences and Medicine, Professor Patrick Kramer and Professor Eva Nogales to share their insights and award-winning discoveries. Professor Nogales will share her view on visualizing the molecular choreography in early stages of human gene transcription. And Professor Kramer will share on the topic of molecular and cellular mechanisms of transcription and its regulation. After the sharing, a panel discussion and Q&A session will be moderated by Professor Danny Chan, Director of the School of Biomedical Sciences and Assistant Dean for Research Postgraduate Studies at the Faculty of Medicine. Now, before the lecture begins, may I please invite Professor Shang Zhang, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong to deliver his welcome address. Let's give him a warm round of applause. <laughs> Professor Patrick Kramer, Professor Eva Logalas, Professor C.S. Lau, distinguished guests, colleagues, students, and ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, and a warm welcome to the University of Hong Kong. I'm honored to be here with you all this afternoon. And on this special occasion of the Shaw Prize Lecture on Life Science and Medicine 2023, this momentous event gives us an opportunity to reflect upon and celebrate the extraordinary achievements and the contributions by brilliant minds in the field of life science and medicine. First and foremost, I would like to express my gratitude to the late Sir Ron Ron Xiao and the Shaw Prize Foundation for their unwavering support and commitment to advance the scientific research I'm promoting a genuine academic excellence. The Shaw Prize has become a beacon of recognition and inspiration, shedding light on the remarkable discoveries that have empowered us to understand life and improve life. Today, we gather here to honor the laureates who have dedicated their lives on pushing the boundaries of knowledge unlocking the mysteries of science, of uh, life, and transforming the way we approach and the medicine and healthcare. Thanks to their pioneer work, not only transform our understanding of science and diseases, but also pave the way for innovative therapy and interventions, thereby saving countless lives. These laureates are relentless and tireless in their pursuit of knowledge and attempt to understand what humanity is truly about. Their unwavering de devotion for further and bettering humanity are truly remarkable. They have clearly earned their rightful places among the greats. Their achievements serve a testament to the lasting power, our curiosity, collaboration, and perseverance in shaping our world. Hong Kong U takes pride in being a hub of scientific excellence. We want to foster a vibrant research community and culture, and further generation, future generation of scientists that aspire to address pressing challenges of our time. It is indeed our great privilege to host this lecture for the show Laureate in Life Science Medicine 2023. Today, today's lecture not only provides us with the opportunity to celebrate the remarkable achievements of Laureates, but also serve a platform for intellectual discourse and exchange of ideas. It is, though, it is through this conversation that we can uncover new insights, challenge existing paradigms, and inspire next generation to pursue, to push the boundary of scientific discovery even further. I wish you all an enlightening journey today. Once again, I extend my warmest welcome, all of you, and let us celebrate the power of science in shaping our bright future for all. Thank you.
as a token of our respect and appreciation for the laureates today, may I invite Professor Tang, President and Vice Chancellor of the University of Hong Kong, to present to Professor Patrick Kramer a souvenir from the university. Let's give Professor Kramer a warm round of applause. Thank you, Professor Tsang. Please remain on stage. May I also invite Professor Tsang to present a souvenir to Professor Eva Nogales on behalf of the university. A round of Thank you, professors. Please both remain on stage. May I also invite Professor Patrick Kramer, together with Professor C.S. Lau, the Dean of Medicine, and Professor ja Danny Chan, our moderator today, onto the stage to take a group photo. May I now invite Professor Danny Chan, Director of the School of Biomedical Sciences and Assistant Dean for Research Postgraduate Studies at the faculty to introduce the two Shaw laureates. Let's give him a round of applause. Thank you. Um, Professor Nagales, Professor Kramer, President Zhang, who just left, uh, Dean Lau, uh, distinguished guests, Colleagues, students, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to the 2023 um, Shaw Prize Lecture on Life Science and Medicine. Uh, it is indeed my great pleasure uh, and honor to introduce uh, the two laureates for this year. I have a rather long introduction, so do bear with me. Okay. Um, Professor Eva Nogales was born in Spain. Uh, she obtained her Bachelor of Science in Physics. Uh, from the Autonomous University of Madrid. Um, later, she did her PhD from the University of Kiel, um, working at the synchrotron radiation source under the supervision of John Borders. <clears throat> she then moved to the US for her postdoctoral training at UC Berkeley uh, in the lab of Ken Dowling. There, using electron microscopy, she was the first to determine the atomic structure of tubulin yeah? and the location of taxol binding site. Now, this is really important because it does show precisely uh, how taxol works as an anti-cancer drug. Uh, she continued her career at Berkeley uh, as an assistant professor in 1998 and rose through the rank to her current position as distinguished, visiting, uh, distinguished professor She's also a Howard Hughes investigator, and with the advance of cryo-EM technology, she became a leader in applying cryo-EM to further study uh, microtubule structure and function and other very large macromolecules assemblies, such as the eukaryotic transcription and translation initiative complex, uh, the polycom complex, and the Theramerase, to name a few. So Eva uh, pioneered cryo-EM and transformed our understanding in the earlier steps in the gene transcription by focusing her effort on the pre-initiation complex. The core of this mini machinery is composed of 14 proteins and DNA, and it's required to get everything started. Right. So this is, complex is very scarce, fragile, and extremely flexible. Thus, solving this structure of this complex is not simple. It is a monumental effect. Uh, Eva received many awards, and most recently, the Women in Cell Science, Cell Biology Award, the Grimwell Medal for Biochemistry, Fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science, and now the Shaw Prize. So, welcome, um, Eva. Professor, Matt, uh, Professor Matt, uh, Patrick Kramer was born in Germany. Uh, he studied chemistry in Stuttgart, Heidelberg, Bristol, and Cambridge. 
and trained in structural biology under Alan Fischer and Crystal Muller at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory, AMBO, in Grenoble. After his PhD, he joined Roger Crombert's lab uh, as a postdoctoral fellow at Stanford, where he solved the first structure of the eukaryotic RNA polymerase, the polymerase II court enzyme of yeast. Patrick's paper was cited as justification for the Nobel Prize, which Roger Crumpert received in 2006. So one can consider the polymerase II, as Patrick referred to it, as the center of life, uh, as no protein can be translated without this key process. In 2001, he obtained a tenure track uh, professorship at the Ludwig Maximilian University in Munich and become a full professor in biochemistry in 2004. And in 2014, as the director of the Max Planck Institute of Biophysical Chemistry in Gottingen. Amongst the many amazing discoveries over this period was the structure of the pole two pre-initiation complex bound to the core mediator, the next step in the transcription. A supermolecular complex of now not 14, but consists of 46 uh, protein with a molecular weight of around about two mega daltons. It's absolutely huge. So since June this year, Patrick is the president of the Max Planck Society. Uh, he has received numerous national and international prizes and recognitions, such as member of EMBO, the German National Academy of Science, and the US National Academy of Science. His research has groundbreaking insights into the mechanism of gene transcription in cells. He made the first movie of transcription that many of us use for, in our teaching. So thank you very much, Patrick, for that. So recently, his team has visualized how SARS-CoV-2 replicates uh, its RNA genome using cryo-EM. So their work reviewed the mechanism of how antivirals that interfere with the function of SARS-CoV-2 RNA polymerase may or may not work so well. Yeah. And how then we can improve it to enable the development of potential new antivirals. Now, both Eva and Patrick are world leaders in the field of gene transcription and structural biology. They review the mechanism underlying the major steps in gene transcription how general transcription factor cooperates with polymerase II, thus placing precise molecular details into the central dogma. The theory put forward in 1958 by Francis Crick in the making of messenger RNA by RNA polymerase, the reading of the information in the DNA sequence and converting it to functional proteins, one of the life's fundamental processes. So thus deciphering how proper gene transcription promotes health and how dysregulation causes disease. And in recognition of these distinguished achievements and contributions, they are awarded in equal shares, the share price in life science and medicine these shares. So without further ado, let us invite Professor Nogales to share with us her topic on visualizing the molecular chorography in early stage of human transcription. Professor Nogales, please. Thank you very much, Professor Shang, for this beautiful introduction and all of you for being here. Uh, you can imagine, but both for Patrick and me and our families, it's been a, a terrific couple of days here in Hong Kong, very special for us, all that we've been going through. And it's, uh, it's very nice that we end, kind of ended up uh, giving an actual science presentation, which is what we like doing, um, talking about science and what we study. So I'm going to be... Uh, indulging a little bit on a remembrance of how we got to where we are now uh, in terms of our particular studies in my lab of the transcription initiation process. So I hope that you enjoyed because I'm going to chronologically move through how we started and how we've, uh, we've ended. Um, so 
my lab is a, is a structural biology lab, so we are interested in visualizing macromolecules, which are the functional components of cells. And for us, this is a way of gaining a fundamental understanding of cellular function, where we're getting down to the chemistry and physics of these uh, individual components. Uh, now, the problem when trying to visualize micromolecules, uh, although the complexes that I'm going to be telling you about for the structural biologies are very large, obviously they are very small objects. Uh, so something like light micro a light microscope is not going to allow you to visualize them. Um, what we have to do is to use transmission electron microscopy. The problem, this is a technique that is being used by material scientists um, to obtain atomic resolution out of a single image, but biological samples have a number of issues. And these have to do with the fact that um, macromolecules, biological samples, cannot exist in the vacuum under which electron microscopes operate. They also are made up of very light elements, carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, so they generate images with very little contrast. Uh, but last and most importantly, they are extremely radiation sensitive. So after they've, uh, a few electrons have gone through of the energies that we use, they start to break into pieces. So the way to overcome these issues is to use cryogenic electron microscopy or cryo-EM. And this allows us to preserve the sample uh, in the vacuum of the electron microscope in a hydrated state. It reduces radiation damage, although it doesn't eliminate it. So we still have to use very low electron doses, meaning that our images are noisy uh, and the contrast is limited. So to yet overcome that hurdle, what we do is we take many images of identical objects, many copies of the uh, macromolecule of interest, and typically we put together between 10,000 or 100,000 of those images to get a three-dimensional structure. So I'm gonna tell you a little bit of how that is done. So to start with, we purify our complex of interest and under conditions where they are biochemically active, we put them on an ion grid, thin them, and plunge them into a cryogen so that we end up with a thin layer of frozen hydrated uh, sample in water that is basically vitrified. So the, the molecules, the proteins, are beautifully preserved. And in this um, solid form of water, they can be introduced by being kept at liquid nitrogen temperature into the vacuum of the elect electron microscope, where we take images that generate two-dimensional projections of the object. And then we process these images computationally, and this is the most uh, arduous part of the process. So to start with, we generate galleries of the objects. We go through 2D classification. We align them, and this allows us to average them, increasing the signal to noise. And when we do this for many different views, we can combine those um, in three dimensions um, to generate a three-dimensional structure that hopefully reaches the resolution that we need to generate atomic models. So basically, this uh, well-preserved sample through this process, computational process, allows us to obtain these two-dimensional structures without the need to crystallize the sample. And this is very important because uh, although X-ray crystallography is very powerful, as Patrick demonstrated with his studies of yeast RNA polymerase, once things get larger or you cannot obtain the macromolecule enough amount, uh, then crystallization becomes a real bottleneck. Um, CryoEM also allows you to study uh, the four these complexes in a fully assembled state uh, and the conditions where they are biochemically active, and it requires very small amounts of sample. And this was particularly important for our studies because we relied most of the time on endogenously purified complexes that exist in very large, very small amounts in, in cells. So um, concentrations can be really, really low, and we actually um, and concentrate those samples on the EN grid as we go along. So something that happened uh, about seven years ago is that new methodology involving both hardware and software, so new direct detectors and new um, software packages to do the processing of the data that I was describing to you, really revolutionized the cryo-electron microscopy field, allowing us both 
to um, describe different states that coexist in solution for a macromolecules, whether they are different conformational states or compositional states, and it allows us to obtain higher and higher resolution, resolutions that are typically make it possible to generate atomic models. So I just want to remind you, because when I tell you our story, we're going to be pre-revolution and post-revolution, and that will make a big difference for the kind of things that we can tell about our samples. Okay, so we've studied, uh, we've utilized these kind of approaches for different types of systems, but the one that I'm going to be telling you about has to do with the transcription uh, initiation process in humans. And I'm going to just give you a very brief introduction with a few words about transcription and almost like a summary of what is gonna, uh, I'm going to be telling you about in this tiny little animated uh, abstract. This is the summary, so if you want to go to sleep now, feel free. <laughs> now it's just the details about this. All right, so uh, before we obtain a structures, what we knew um, uh, about these components of the transcription pre-initiation complexes was represented by little blobs uh, like the ones that I'm showing you here. We knew from the uh, heroic studies of biochemists like Bob Rader what were the components that were required for the transcription initiation process and even the order in which uh, this came together on core promoter DNA. And of course, in addition to the, co the, the central um, complex, which is the RNA polymerase II, which is very large, it's a half a megadalton uh, complex of 12 subunit, there are many other components in this transcription pre-initiation complex. And I'm gonna start by telling you about TF2D which is a 1.3 megadalton complex by itself, is made up of the Tata binding protein, or TBP, and about 13 TBP-associated uh, TBP factors, or TAFs. And this is the complex that is required to bind to those core promoter sequences around the transcription start site and recruit uh, the rest of the components, polymerase included, uh, but also Another complex that we've studied quite a bit, TF2H, which is itself almost the size of RNA polymerase, and it contains ATPA's activity required for the opening of the duplex so that one of the strands become, can be copied by the polymerase, and also kinase activity that acts on RNA polymerase, uh, basically licensing to uh, leave the promoter and go into the elongation phase. So we started by studying um, TF2D, uh, I was convinced to work on this by my colleague Robert Tijan. I can't thank him enough to uh, get me in, uh, in the transcription initiation process. Um, but this turned out to be a really, really difficult uh, complex to deal with. And for many years we struggled until we realized that what was uh, making things very difficult was that the complex, remember 1.3 megadaltons, is made up of three main lobes that we call A, B, and C. We were very non-committal because we didn't really know what each one of them was doing. In any case, what turned up is that low bay is extremely flexible and it moves by 150 angstrom, which is huge in a structural uh, biology terms. And we could quantitate the, the different states that the complex was in, and basically it oscillated between a canonical state where low bay interacts with C and what we call a reorganized state in which A interact with, with B. And what was very, uh, very interesting and very cool is that when we gave TF2D uh, core promoter DNA and the transcription factor to A, 
that distribution of a state shifted towards the reorganized state. And when we do the three-dimensional reconstruction, it ends up that is this reorganized state, the one that binds to DNA. If you think about the canonical, all the sites that re are required to be in the right position to bind the DNA are not there. They have to reorganize to engage the DNA. So we published this very well. Um, but you have to realize, given the size of these, the resolution was about 40 angstrom. These were the years where we referred to CRAR-EM as blobology, because blobs were what we could uh, determine. So uh, this is 2013. Remember, pre-revolution, eventually, the revolution came, and we got one of these wonderful detectors at, at Berkeley. And we wanted to go past what we had seen before. And in addition to uh, using the direct detector, what we did is to concentrate on the bound form of the complex. And to do that, we use a method that actually was developed for, the, uh, for other studies that I'm going to describe in a second by Yuan He, who is here and right, <laughs> right there, sitting at the front, in which um, core promoter DNA is immobilized on magnetic uh, steptabidin coated beads. And we can add uh, these using tiny little volumes, our purified TF2D with TF2A incubated, and then wash up the beads uh, of anything that is not bound to the DNA, and then cut the DNA off from the beads and put that on the EN grids. And what we got then is a complex that is stably bound, more or less, is, is, is tightly bound to uh, the, the DNA. And I hope you can see that of low bay, which is what is shown here in yellow, that part that moves, once it's engaged with DNA, we only see a small part. The rest is floating around, and actually, we have to play with the threshold that we use for displaying the density because it's not very much visible. But it's contributing to not being able to align very well our images. So what we did is to mask that region that is flexible and concentrate our alignments on the rest. And that allows us to improve the resolution sufficiently that we could take the crystal structure that was already known of TBP bound to core promoter DNA to Tata box and, and TF2A and dock it into the structure. And that allows us to then um, locate the position of the different core promoter sequences that we were, we were using in our study and see that they were being touched and recognized by other regions in the complex. We use this trick of masking out flexible element one more time to concentrate on love C and how it binds to DNA. And this was now at a resolution of about seven angstrom where we could take existing crystal structures or homology models that we could uh, generate of some of the components and propose how the module was organized, what component it had, and which elements within, especially TAF1 and TAF2, were contacting and reading uh, the sequences in the core promoter. But after this heroic effort, we only had lobe C as is bound to DNA, and we had no idea what was in lobe A and lobe B yet. So what we did was to collect a huge amount of data of TF2D by itself. And, and this, remember, is, is, is incredibly flexible and did a lot of three-dimensional classification. One of the things that that allowed us to see was um, the kind of trajectory that the lobe follows, this low bay follows, as it floats around in solution. And this is, uh, these are different, uh, the, col the rainbow color are the low bay in these various positions with respect to the rest of the complex, which is shown in blue. And I superimpose where we know the DNA and TF2A are going to end up. And that knob that you see here is actually TF TBP. And what we see in these two orthogonal views is that it follows an arch that ultimately will end up with TBP being where it should be binding to the DNA. But of course, in the process of classifying, we split our data and we cannot push the resolution. So we combine this again and use a number of tricks to get the reconstruction of the different lobes at different resolutions depending on their mobility. And ultimately, we could identify the position of every subunit and generate an atomic model for all the lobes, where we can now assign the position of all the TAFs components. So something that, uh, that helped us was that low bay, sorry, low B and low bay are structurally related. They build on a number of tufts that contain histone fold-like domains that form a core together with TAF5. 
and that is repeated from one to the other. What makes it different is that low B has this particular TAF, TAF A, which is there in a single copy, that tethers it to the rest of the complex, while in low B, what we have is TAF 3, Will, which define a platform now for the binding of another two TAFs that have histone fold do, uh, domains, TAF 13 and 11, and these are the ones that bind to TBP. Okay? So in that state, TBP is completely inhibited. Every single surface that is involved for in, in interactions that are relevant for the formation of the PIC and the binding to DNA have, are blocked. So TBP in TF2D is inhibited. And the whole point is that TBP will only be released and allow the uh, formation, the assembly of the PIC, once TF2D have re truly recognized that co-promoter sequences exist, that that is the start of a gene. So what we, what we have ultimately was a structure for this canonical state, which cannot bind uh, DNA, and where TBP is inhibited, and then also a structure bound to DNA in which TBP had been deployed uh, in, the, in the DNA, and now uh, the PIC can form. And what we study is are all the intermediate steps that lead from one to the other and how that relates to binding the DNA and releasing one step at a time TBP. And that's summarized here. So when you mix TF2D, we're back to mixing, not purifying. You mix TF2D, TF2A, and core promoter DNA. And we get complexes that are just TF2D with the lobe in different positions and that bound to A and to B. So this is a whole range. Um, but in here, the thing that is in common is that that TBP is completely inhibited. It's inhibited on this surface, on this surface of the saddle, and on the uh, concave uh, surface that ultimately needs to bind to DNA. Now, we also see in that mixture complexes that have started to bind DNA, and they are bound to the downstream core promoter elements, and now they are biasing low bay with TVP to start scanning, touching the DNA. And because of the geometry of the complex and how DNA is grabbed on one end, it places the Tata or Tata lag uh, uh, sequences close to where that lobe is kind of touching and sensing. So, that local concentration can start to allow um, the competition of DNA for these uh, inhibiting peptides that come from TAF1, but still in, a, in, a, in conditions where the DNA is not truly engaged by TBP and the DNA is still straight. We also see complexes very similar to that, but where TF2A is bound. TF2A binds to low B, and now, again, is placed in the right position to start competing with these um, inhibiting peptides and binding uh, to TBP. And it is in the presence of TF2A that now the complex really has a chance, T TBP has a chance to bind in a high affinity state to the DNA, bend it uh, in the form that we all, uh, that we have known for many years, and in the process, that state is incompatible with the binding to TAF 11 and, and 13, is, um, and the binding basically releases, pops uh, TBP from the rest of the complex, liberating the surface that now will bind to TF2B. And this is very important because TF2B interacts with the polymerase and will give rise to the, you know, the first stages of assembly now of the whole um, PIC. So, I'm going to go back 13 years, so pre-revolution one more time. And this was the work that Yuan He did when he was a postdoc in, in the lab. And he developed this method, as I told you, to purify complexes as they're engaging co with core promoter DNA. But in his case, he was following what happens after TPP has been deployed. So because of the limited resolution that we had at that time, what, what he did was to follow uh, what um, Bob Rader had defined at different stages in the assembly of the pre-initiation complex to obtain sequential complexes of larger and larger compositional complexity and interpret them one at a time. So to start with, he had the DNA, TF2A, TBP, TF2B, and the polymerase. And we had the structure from Patrick of the yeast polymerase bound with 2B, and we have 
previous structures of TPP with 2A and the DNA, so we could put it all together and we could see that it fitted our density, so that was very reassuring. You can see that there was part of the DNA that we could not see because due to flexibility. So he repeated the purification process and the analysis, but now including TF2F, and that caused a conformational cause addition of density that we could now interpret it in purple as TF2F, conformational changes on the polymerase, and the grabbing onto the DNA so that now we can see its full length. And then he kept doing this. He added TF2E, and eventually he added TF2H. And that allowed us to interpret these densities uh, and, and see how the complex builds on core promoter DNA. So this was pre-revolution. So after we got the detector, he went at it again. Um, but disappointingly, the resolution didn't get very high. And this was when we checked what was the issue, had to do with the fact that um, TF2H and the, the DNA were flexing with respect to the rest of the complex, OK? So there was conformational heterogeneity that was, again, making hard the alignment of the images. So he followed the same trick that we follow for TF2D, which was to mask TF2H and concentrate on the core of the PIC. And that allowed him to push the resolution to a point where it was possible to generate atomic models. Um, so I'll, I'll tell you more about this in a second. But what we had at that point were, on one hand, the structure of TF2D bound to DNA. And on the other, the structure uh, of the rest of the PIC built on TBP. So we could overlap the two of them and generate a synthetic model, if you want a computational model, of how everything will come together. We also uh, had from Patrick's uh, lab the uh, structure of the yeast mediator and polymerase. So we could also overlap it and see that everything was compatible. And this was a model generated in 2016 that had been recently um, corroborated, but in more details and, and with, with confirmational changes that are required in the process, both by Patrick's lab, Yuan uh, lab, and the Shu's lab here in China and Fudan uh, University. So fantastic uh, work. But let me take you back to 2016. What Yuan did was to study uh, that core promoter uh, and the full PIC, sorry, uh, assemble, although I'm showing you just the core, on three DNA substrates, one duplex DNA, one that mimicked a transcription bubble, and one that mimicked an initially transcribing complex also with um, some RNA um, already pre-assembled. And he could get the details of how these different templates were being in, um, engaged in the conformational changes that were happening in the complex as the process uh, progressed. And then just showing you an example of the initially transcribing complex to give you an idea of how, in this case, the active sites, um, active site looked like um, at the resolution that we had at the time, which were around three and a half, four angstrom resolution for that region. OK, so. Um, Remember, we forgot about TF2H because it was moving. We were able to study TF2H by itself and get an atomic model for it. And now, um, with most of it, missing some of the complex that does have the kinase activity. And we could now place this in the context of, um, of Yuan's uh, structures and see that there is a conformational change that happens between TF2H by, by, being by itself and engaging with the PIC and binding DNA. And this is animated here, um, just extrapolating from one state to the other. And this motion actually has to do with the activation of XPV, this ATPase um, that is involved in opening of the transcription bubble. So I'm going to put all of this, we generated this movie that puts everything together and demonstrated something that had been proposed before based on biochemistry, which is that XPB acts as a DNA translocase. So it moves on the DNA, pushing it towards the active side of the polymerase, induce also twisting it, inducing torque that is released through the unwinding of the DNA. And that opening of the transcription bubble is then stabilized by elements within the PIC, the polymerase, TF, uh, TF2B, et cetera. Okay? So this is a little animation that shows how the DNA will be pushed 
the uh, bubble will be open, and then during the transcription initiation process, TF XPB will keep on uh, railing in uh, the DNA to the active site. The part that we didn't see is the very flexible part that is the kinase domain. We could take this kinase domain, which is on the opposite spectrum, it's very small for uh, cryo-EM, and we could study it, get an atomic structure, and um, then paste it together to get the structure of the full TF2H. And, you know, this um, cryo-EM now is getting to resolutions that really allow us to visualize, in this case, an anti-cancer uh, molecule that is in clinical that was in clinical trials uh, at the time with enough resolution to be able to get down to hydrogen bonds and what is the uh, origin of its specificity for this particular kinase and so on. So I'm going to just uh, summarize um, everything that I have told you in this animation that was made by Janet Iwasa that puts together a lot of data from many years and it shows uh, TF2D in its glorious. Um, conformational heterogeneity with elements that we know uh, are flexibly attached and bind to um, modifications in histone in the plus one nucleosome that retain TF2D where it can recognize core promoter sequences and with the help of TF2A and the right geometry, uh, finally release, uh, deploy TBP on the DNA, freeing the surface that will recruit T TF to B, and now the rest of the PIC. So all of these are little um, interpolation, if you want, between the different structures that, that we were able to obtain that shows how each of the steps in the process of assembly requires that the previous elements are there bound to the core promoter, uh, ultimately leading to um, the recruitment of this large TF2H um, complex that has to become activated um, from a, an inhibited state um, through interaction with the rest of the PNC and the DNA. This is the conformational change, the release of the, of the CAC. And now this is in the right geometry for XPB um, to take steps in an ATP hydrolysis dependent manner to push the DNA and to um, torque it into opening. I just want to tell you that all of that happens in the context of expression of every single human gene, and that there has to be regulation. And regulation comes in a number of ways, but one of them has to do with the recruitment of transcription coactivator complexes that set the right chromatin structure uh, in terms of positioning of nucleosome, but also post-translational modifications in the nucleosomes. And I'm going to give you just to show you something more recent, and that has to do with transcriptional regulation, an example that has to do with SAGA, which is um, one of these transcriptional coactivators. We like it because uh, you remember that I told you that TF2D has these two lobes that build on this histone fold containing tufts. That module actually is also present in SAGA. And, and serves like a um, hub um, that then connects to other functionalities, among them histone acetyl transferase and histone deubiquitinase activities that remodel and, and, uh, and affect the, um, uh, the state of chromatin around the core promoter. This complex doesn't directly bind to DNA. It actually uses this large uh, subunit, which is called TRAP, that will be shown in gray, that interacts with gene-specific activators with transcription factors to bring the complex to the site. So we obtain the structure of the human complex, and um, where this is the module that I told you is kind of shared, or something very similar to what was in lobe uh, B and lobe A in TF2D. The complex, in addition, uh, it has a number of flexible elements which include and a splicing module, which is very mysterious. Uh, it doesn't exist in budding yeast, but it's present in high eukaryotes. And then it had really extremely flexible elements that we only see in 2D, um, which are these histone-modifying um, elements that we think need the flexibility to be able to modify several nucleosomes around the core promoter. So 
Uh, when we obtained the structure of the human complex, structures of two fungi had been obtained both by Patrick Kramer and by Patrick Schulz. So we could compare uh, now the two uh, um, because there are significant differences. And this is very interesting because for the core PIC that I've been telling you about up to now that is required commonly for transcribing every gene, the similarity between yeast and human is really, really high. Is it the case also for these complexes that are more involved in regulatory steps? And it turns out that there are more significant differences than what we were expecting that have to do with uh, the human having um, duplication of genes, uh, long um, insertions, and this additional splicing module. So um, the core of the human complex is extremely similar to the core of the yeast uh, complex. And you can superimpose them, and this is very obvious that they, they are the same thing. Now I'm going to show you the rest of the complex. And it turns out that this module that is very uh, conserved and the trap module, which is very conserved, lie in uh, interact with each other in a completely different way between human and yeast. So this is the core that I was telling you, and the trap subunit for human is here, while the tra homologous subunit for yeast <laughs> is interacted with a completely different surface. This is super interesting from an evolutionary point of view. Uh, a little um, more details, there is this particular domain, inter 5, that uh, in yeast is in a different position that actually overlaps where, where in humans is the splicing module. So th there's no splicing module that can be accommodated in the context of, of the yeast. And this is, for example, uh, in yellow is a, is a part of a subunit that has this long extension in human that is not present in yeast that wraps around trap. And I'm mentioning this because um, Saga contains a, a number, it, it has been found to have to be um, the location of human mutations that give rise to a number of diseases. And just showing two uh, of these mutations um, that actually each one of them, single pre-mutation, ends up giving rise to a ne uh, neuro uh, um, neurological disorders during, that occur during development. And these are in regions that are involved in this interaction of the yellow subunit with trap in that element that is not present in yeast. So in this particular case, when it comes to regulation, it really, uh, you know, having the human makes a difference to be able to explain these uh, genetic diseases in human. So this is what I wanted to tell you. This is our journey or part of our journey in transcription, in our transcriptional studies. Um, Patricia and Michael were um, the pioneers in the study of TF2D by CryoEM that detected this heterogeneity and ultimately Mike was able to show that it has to do, this mo motion of low bay of 150 tons has to do with the binding of DNA in a, um, in a very interesting manner. Uh, the structure was then pushed to high resolution after the resolution revolution in CryoEM by Robert and Abby. Um, the work on PIC was done by Yuan He, and the work of TF2H by, um, by Basel uh, Greber. And for all of these studies, uh, Jay is our lab manager, and she's the one that grows huge amounts of HeLa cells for the purification of all these uh, complex. And, and for Saga, uh, Dominic in the lab worked with Megan Esbin, a graduate student, in the lab of my colleagues Tijan and Darzac uh, labs. And this is just thanks to years of collaboration with, the, with Robert Tijan and my colleague at UC Berkeley. And with this, I finished. I hope um, this was interesting to you. And if you guys have questions now or later, I would love to, um, to try to answer them. Thank you so much. I'd like to now introduce Professor Patrick Kramer to the stage to deliver his lecture titled Molecular and Cellular Mechanisms of Transcription and Its Regulation. So let's give Professor Kramer a warm round of applause.
Well, thank you so much for having us. Um, we had a fantastic evening yesterday celebrating. Uh, it was really unforgettable. And uh, the question is, of course, what are we celebrating? It's uh, scientific achievements, but uh, it's the scientific achievements of many people. Eva Nogales just mentioned uh, the important figures in her lab. And I have written down the names, you know, of the people who have been involved over the years. This is now an effort that goes on for well over 20 years. And you can see with the past co-workers, the ones that are highlighted, they have set up their own laboratories. And you also see the present group. And I will actually concentrate today on the work of those people highlighted in green um, towards the end of the talk because this is unpublished work, and it's a good tradition in science that we also share unpublished results so uh, that you don't, otherwise you could look on YouTube or you could study the textbook, but uh, it's always good to have some unpublished data and, and be excited about new things. But um, another thing I wanted to say is that these people came from about 30 different countries. And that is so wonderful to be in science because you get to know people from all over the world. You learn about each other and science is actually building bridges between people on different continents. And I think that is a very important aspect of science that we shouldn't forget. Now, why do we both spend a large part of our life on studying gene transcription? I think uh, the answer is that it's really a fundamental, a central process that is important for any living cell. And when you look at metazoa, when you look at uh, higher organisms, then you see that transcription regulation is at the heart of cell differentiation, but also the development of organisms. And I want to take you through that process today um, and building actually on the beautiful introductions uh, by Eva on the structural biology methods but also on the overall process of transcription. And just to remind you in the beginning, you all know this, that um, there's three RNA polymerases purified by Bob Röder actually in the year when I was born in 1969. Uh, RNA polymerase one, two, and three, and they make the different types of RNA and those RNAs are all needed to synthesize proteins, which are the, doing the heavy lifting in all of the cells. Now, the big change in the field was that we had now these structures available of the polymerases. So you open the black box and you see the machine, and now you can study how does the machine interact with nucleic acids, how does it interact with other protein factors, and how do things come together? And what is the dynamics behind it? How can you regulate the process? And that is something that is extremely fascinating uh, to me, at least, and also to Eva Nogales and many others in the field. Now, it took us about 10 years to collect enough structures of RNA polymerase II to make this movie, the first movie of gene transcription. And it depicts the nucleotide addition cycle. So you see the active site of the enzyme. DNA is in blue and the RNA is in red. And now you see the nucleoside triphosphate substrate entering in orange. The active site is closing and now a phosphodiester bond is formed at the active site. And the pyrophosphate ion is leaving. And now the RNA has been extended by one nucleotide and it has to move out of the active site. This is what we call translocation. So the next DNA template base is brought into the active site and the whole nucleotide addition cycle can start all over. And this actually happens as we sit here in all of our cells at a speed of 30 nucleotides per second. This is what transcription is about. Now, we understood the fundamental process, right? We understand how DNA is used as a template to synthesize an RNA copy of the gene. But how is it regulated? Can you imagine that almost 10% of all your genes are just encoding transcription factors that are doing nothing but 
the regulation of transcription. So we know that it's above 1,500 something, it's about 2,000 factors that regulate RNA polymerase II transcription. And these are normally DNA binding factors, they bind to their target genes and then they switch on transcription. They bring the polymerase to the gene and they switch on the gene. And you see here over 30 different human tissues and the expression pattern of these different genes for transcription factors. And you see that different um, transcription factors are active in different tissues. So that means, you know, the identity of the cells can be defined by the expression of those transcription factors because that defines which genes are actually active in any one cell. So how can you even dare to study such a process? So complicated. Right? So the approach that we took is that we combined structural biology. Eva has wonderfully um, described how you solve such structures and how you also make these models and, and come to conclusions. Now we combine this structural biology, which is done in the test tube, right, with purified components. It's basically biochemistry. We combine it with functional genomics, which you see on the right. So we collect data in living cells. So we find out which are the genes that are active, which are the proteins that are bound to the genes, um, where is the polymerase, how much time does it spend at certain sites of the gene. This is what functional genomics can do to you. And when you have the in vitro and the in vivo approach and you combine them, you can get very beautiful insights into transcription regulation. Now we use this repertoire of methods to serve the community and to provide snapshots of the different stages at the beginning of transcription, which are the different stages of transcription where this regulation can occur, where these hundreds and hundreds of proteins are actually targeting the process to regulate gene transcription. So it starts with opening of the chromatin so that the promoter is accessible, and then the pre-initiation complex is formed, PIC, Eva Nogales has described that in great detail. Then the DNA is opened. The polymerase starts by making messenger RNA, but it doesn't get very far. It's normally pausing at about 50 nucleotides downstream of the start site. And then there needs to be the, a regulatory signal. It needs to be activated. Then the polymerase is released into the gene, and it now carries all the factors that you need to pass the nucleosomes. So can you believe it? These, you know, the polymerase actually goes through chromatin, it goes through the nucleosomes at a speed of about you know, passing 10 to 15 nucleosomes each minute. It's unbelievable that it can do that. And we will end, I will end my talk with the first movie of the polymerase actually passing through one of those nucleosomes. Now, these are all structures we solved over the years, so we got a lot of mechanistic details of the different processes, but I'm not going to talk most of it about most of it, just highlight a few steps of the whole process. So over the last five to ten years, we also added some intermediary stages because transcription is actually coupled to other nuclear events, right? Chromatin transitions, RNA processing events, and um, the way you have to look at it is that inside of a cell nucleus, all of these events are somehow coupled. The proteins talk to each other. They are social molecules. They like to bind to each other. They like to activate each other, to regulate each other. Now, just one slide on the pre-initiation complex. Um, I don't need to repeat what Eva Nogales has done. They have done this pioneering work on the human pre-initiation complex, concentrating more on TF2D, and we, as Eva said, have concentrated on the mediator complex, which is actually this complex here in blue, and cyan. But what I wanted to uh, tell you once more is how conserved transcription actually is. So on the left, you have the yeast complex, which is you know, a, a unicellular eukaryotic um, cell, and on the right, you have the human complex, and you know they look really very similar indeed. There are some interesting details that differ, but overall, this process is very highly conserved. Now, to talk more about these 
you know, unpublished and more recent data, I want to take you to another level, and that is the level of chromatin. If you look into a cell nucleus, this is probably what you will see one day when the methods have advanced further. Um, but currently, we don't have such views. It's very difficult to look inside the nucleus. It's very, very crowded, very dark inside there. But there's an artist, who, David Gutzer, who um, thinks it looks like this, more or less. And I think it's a, a fair description. But I want to emphasize that gene transcription and chromatin, they have co-evolved. So chromatin is not just there to package the genes, but also as a you know, a means to regulate transcription further. And I think for the next generation, and that's why I'm showing you this, the motivation must be to find out how transcription occurs inside of chromatin, right? Because it's even more difficult to imagine how things move and how everything works inside such a dense environment. So we took the very first steps, and I will show you a few examples. So here on the left, you have the pre-initiation complex. Right at the promoter, transcription start site, and then to the right, you have a nucleosome, and that's about the distance that you find in yeast genes. So we were solving a structure of the pre-initiation complex bound to a nucleosome. So this extends now the DNA to the nucleosome, which is the smallest unit of chromatin, and we see these rather loose interactions uh, between a factor called TF2H that also Eva Nogales has introduced, and the nucleosome. And we think that the nucleosome can actually help to position the pre-initiation complex, solving an old mystery of how the pre-initiation complex actually finds a promoter if TF2D is not involved or if there's no promoter elements in the DNA sequence. And there's good reason to believe also from functional genomics from Frank Pugh's lab that the nucleosome can position or help position the polymerase at the start site of genes in yeast now, when you go to the human system, you see something very exciting. And that is, you know, depending on the distance of the pre-initiation complex and the nucleosome, uh, the nucleosome can be actually repressive. So if you move the nucleosome too close to the transcription start site, it interferes with the pre-initiation complex, and it can actually repress genes or down-regulate genes. And you can see that in vivo on the left, as well as in vitro when you have a defined biochemical assay. So you begin to believe this, and then we could actually solve structures of the active and the repressed state. And that is quite fascinating because you can see again how all the work comes together from different laboratories. So if you look on the left, this is the active state where the nucleosome is next to the pre-initiation complex. And the TF2H factor is actually bound to the DNA the way that Eva Nogales has shown it to you. But when you look on the right, it looks very different. You have an inactive state. Now the nucleosome is so close that it interferes with the normal pre complex assembly. And then TF2H is switching into a conformation that is... Um, that is actually inactive, and that corresponds to the one that Eva Nogales has just shown for free TF2H. So the reason why I tell this story now is because it shows you how science works. You know, one laboratory has a result, then you publish that result. Then you, another laboratory is doing another project, and they can use this result, and then get to the next result which is again published, and then that is shared with the community, and yet another laboratory can use that to advance science. And it's a global network where we share information and where we advance together as a community. So basically, all of these things come together. Uh, you see an inactive state, and then you rediscover it, and it can be actually induced by a nucleosome, and you form a bridge between chromatin and transcription, and your understanding gets deeper and deeper. Now, but at many human genes, what happens is that the nucleosome is not close to the start site, but it's further downstream. And the reason why that happens is because the polymerase moves to this pause state. So the polymerase initiates, and then it moves downstream by about 50 uh, nucleotides, and then it pauses. And then in front of the polymerase, there will be uh, a nucleosome. 
So we can make a model of that pause complex. So now you have the pre-initiation complex on the left, then the pause polymerase in the center, and then on the right you have the nucleosome. So this is a model, but it's interesting that these distances that you observe in living cells in vivo can actually be recapitulated by the uh, model when you have the different structures of these complexes. Now, the pause polymerase needs to be activated, and this is what's happening uh, at those genes that are switched on. And then what happens is that there's phosphorylation events, and these factors are exchanged, these elongation factors are exchanged. So the red factor is a negative factor, and then these other factors that you see in the active elongation complex that we call EC star, these are other factors and they are positive factors. They help the polymerase to move further. So we actually analyzed that switch from the pause state, from the inactive state to the active state, and we solved both structures. And when you compare the pause to the active polymerase, what you see is that those factors that you see here in red and in orange, they bind to overlapping sites. So that's exciting because basically a polymerase can either be paused or it can be active. It cannot be both. It can either bind the red factor, NELF, or this orange factor, which is called PATH. So how do you exchange the factors? It's a phosphorylation event. Actually, it's many, many phosphorylation events. And there's a very critical kinase, which is called CDK9. It's part of the positive transcription elongation factor B. And that kinase can phosphorylate many proteins. And that leads to a destabilization of the post complex and a stabilization of the active elongation complex. So the switch is due to phosphorylation. And you can now inhibit that kinase and find out what is happening when you inhibit that switch in living cells. So we are now inside of human cells. And we inhibit that particular kinase that enables you to switch the polymerase from the pause to the active state. And what you see is that the pause duration on the left is going up. This is what you expect, right? The polymerase now pause is longer because the kinase that is needed to escape from the pause state is actually inhibited. But what was unexpected at the time when we did those studies is that the initiation frequency was going down. But that was beautiful to see because it immediately explained how at the stage of pausing you can actually switch genes on and off. It's because the pausing has a feedback to the initiation and you can regulate initiation, so how often a polymerase actually initiates and starts. Now there was, these are two mechanisms, but there was a third one being uh, proposed by many laboratories based on all kinds of data. Um, we have also done a little bit of that together with Torben Jensen's lab. And what many laboratories have seen over the last years is that there's an alternative pathway. Instead of activating the pause polymerase, you can actually also terminate the polymerase. And then it's over. You have to start all over again, right? Because you lose the polymerase from the gene. And that is a new mechanism of transcription regulation. And it involves a very, very large protein called the integrator complex. And we have actually solved that structure of the polymerase together with this large integrator complex, which recognizes the post polymerase and then terminates transcription. So how does that work? Just a quick movie to show you, because now we have a lot of unpublished structures of the integrator complex bound to the post polymerase. Now you see the integrator is uh, flexible, and now it can recognize the post polymerase. And what happens is that there's a sting, as we call it, which interferes with this green protein, DSIF, and that helps uh, the polymerase to release the nucleic acids. It can release now the DNA more easily because there's a so-called clamp that this green factor uh, is forming, which is released. So that is part of the termination mechanism. Another mechanism is the cleavage of the nascent RNA, which we've also uh, observed in the presence of the integrator complex. And then eventually the integrator goes back into an inactive state, uh, which is not cleaving RNA, and which is not terminating polymerases. That's obviously important because you only want to terminate these post complexes uh, in certain scenarios where you want to switch the genes off. Once you want to switch the genes on, 
uh, you need to inactivate this integrator complex. Now, we had to show, of course, that this mechanism really exists in cells, right? We have characterized it uh, in vitro using biochemistry, using structural biology, but does it really exist uh, in living cells? Do you actually regulate genes in cells using termination? And the answer is yes, this is also unpublished. You know, we can transdifferentiate cells, we can uh, convert cells from B cells into macrophages by expressing a transcription factor. So they really change their identity. And when you then follow uh, how all these thousands of human genes are changing their activity, some of the genes go down, right? They're downregulated, and some of the genes go up. So you can actually quantify these processes. And what we found is that a certain group of genes, we call it pre-B genes, they are downregulated because this early termination is increased. You see that here in green. And then another group of genes in violet, you see that they are called IMAC2 genes. And those genes are actually upregulated, they're activated. And this happens due to reduced termination. So you can really regulate genes at this level of early termination, promote approximate termination. And this is uh, shown here in these cartoons. So, you know, you go from normal transcription when you actually downregulate genes, you go to early termination. And for upregulation, you have early termination in the beginning, and then you stop it so you can upregulate the genes and more RNA can be made. Now, if that was too complicated, then this is the only slide you need to remember. <laughs> if you remember that slide, you get the basics. Three mechanisms of gene regulation that we've identified now. Two of them, there's a lot of published material, which is the initiation rate, right? More initiation, more RNA synthesis. And the pausing, which has been studied by many laboratories around the world. And now this early termination has emerged as a third regulatory mechanism. And why are these processes able to regulate genes? It's because they can change the number of mRNA molecules made per time. So if you make more mRNA per time, your gene is more active. If you make less mRNA per time, your gene is less active. And when you talk about transcription regulation, in the end it comes down to the number of mRNA molecules you make per time. And these are the three main processes. So your generation, what you now have to do, please, you have to find out which of those factors is regulating which of these three processes. Because this is a general scheme, and different genes will be regulated more on one of those mechanisms or another, or even two or three of them. And that is very exciting to find out which of the transcription factors can regulate which of those three mechanisms. That is for the future, I think. And then the final thing, because my time is almost over, uh, I just want to show you this movie, how polymerase passes through nucleosomes. Um, you know, we solved many different structures of a polymerase that actually has transcribed into a nucleosome. So basically, the polymerase is a very strong motor, right? So it can unravel part of the DNA of the nucleosome and transcribe into it. And now, when we take a lot of snapshots, we can actually animate this process of nucleosome transcription. And this is the first movie of this kind that we could make. Uh, so you see the polymerase moving forward, so now it's transcribing into the nucleosome. It's unwrapping the DNA from the histone octamer. But the nucleosome, you know, is a very strong part. It's um, held together by strong DNA protein interactions. So sometimes the whole process runs backwards. And um, now that you lost, we just lost one of the histone uh, dimers. Sometimes this whole process runs backwards because the DNA protein interactions are supposed to reform, right? Because that gives you energy. You can stabilize the system this way. So if that happens, everything runs backwards. You will see that now. So when you run backwards, then the RNA is also extruded. It's actually backtracked into a pore. You see the red RNA coming out of this pore now. It's because the whole process is running backwards. And then the polymerase is trapped, and you need to 
release the spectrate RNA to reactivate the polymerase, right? So it's called a state of arrest. The polymerase is arrested, and you need this factor TF2S to escape from this state of arrest. And then the polymerase can try again to go through the nucleosome. So in the end, the polymerase will always win because when the nucleosome wins transiently uh, and the polymerase is pushed back and backtracked, there's a factor that can rescue and restart it, and then it can try again to go through uh, the nucleosome. So that is what I wanted to show you. We have the different intermediates, and we also begin to understand how you convert these different intermediates. We also begin to understand what are the main processes at which you can regulate. I presented to you the three main stages where regulation occurs, initiation, pausing, and early termination. And the future is bright because uh, you can now find out, uh, you know, in different cell types, which of those regulatory mechanisms are applied at which genes, which factors are responsible for this type of regulation and so forth. And then, of course, also we need to one day figure out the mechanisms for these gene-specific regulatory events. Here's the summary. I think it's fair to say that due to the work of Eva Nogales' lab and our lab and, and several other labs, for example, also the Shu lab here um, uh, in China, uh, you can say that the transcription mechanism uh, has been elucidated by this very you know, strong structure function approach. And we have defined three fundamental mechanisms of regulation that are now emerging and they need in-depth analysis. And finally, I've shown you some unpublished or recently published data uh, that show that there's a very dynamic interplay between chromatin and the transcription machinery. And a lot of work needs to be done before this is entirely clear how that actually works. Another reminder that you need these great people that I mentioned in the beginning, but also you need money, and I'm very grateful to the many funding agencies that gave us money, and also to our long-term collaborator, Henning Urlaub, who's a mass spectroscopist. And that's what I wanted to tell you. Thanks again for hosting the two of us today. Thank you very much, Professor Kramer, for the exciting lecture. We're going to now move on to a panel discussion, and then after that, we will have a Q&A session. So could I invite the professors and our moderator, Professor Danny Chan, to the stage? Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Eva and Patrick, for these two wonderful lectures. Uh, in the audience, we have uh, high school students, uh, PhD students, postdoctoral fellows, and young PIs and old PIs. Um, I think you mature PIs. <laughs> mature, wise, wise. <laughs> um, I think your lecture has probably given us each one of us something to take home, right? Um, before I let the uh, audience to really ask questions, and I'd like actually the high school students to actually ask more questions if you can. Um, I want to focus on, on actually two aspects that uh, you've mentioned. Obviously, transcription itself, which you explained very clearly, um, and also the technology that uh, you've taken to visualize that, which is going from... Um, X-ray crystallography, MR, and so forth now to cryo-EM. I think for many of the audience, particularly young audience, really don't know what cryo-EM is all about and why we're so excited about cryo-EM. And in fact, our faculty had just built a cryo-EM lab and it's brand new and uh, we're all very excited about it. Perhaps maybe you can share with us and those who are not so, you know, uh, well known about what cryo EMs all about. Can you get the younger audience excited about it? How can you not be excited about cryo? <laughs> so, 
You know, first of all, you have to, you have to believe that obtaining the structures that Patrick and I show you today are is important. That getting to see how these little machines that operate in the cells, how they look, how they interact with each other, how they have moving parts that grab, that release, that push, is important for us to understand how the cell function and then also how that function can be regulated or misregulated, which means when it stops working and it gives rise to, rise to disease. So if you agree that getting a structures of these biological molecules is important, now let's think how, how does it normally, traditionally, the way um, these structures have been generated was to obtain very, very large quantities of the protein, say, of interest very, very large quantities, and then go through a process of crystallization, which is a process in which these molecules, which are normally happily floating in, in, in solution in water, actually precipitate, is what happens when, if you have done experiments uh, to crystallize, you know, you, you dissolve sugar, and then the sugar evaporates and it recrystallizes, it kind of precipitates out of a solution. Um, it is not trivial. It is easy to do with salt or sugars, but it's very hard to do with proteins because they are flexible and large. So when you obtain a crystal, then you shoot x-rays through, through it, and through a computational process, you recover the structure. But it is the crystallization process requires all this amount of, pro of, of material. It requires that the protein is not too flexible or too large. With cryo-EM, Many of these um, bottlenecks, these challenges are overcome. You need very little amount of sample. You don't need to go through the process of crystallizing it. You just image it directly in an electron microscope and then do computational analysis of it. So the, the examples of the large complexes that both of us show you today uh, bound to nucleosome, bound to each other, bound to DNA, with all these flexible elements, they're basically impossible to do by, by X-ray crystallography, but you can do it with cryo-electron microscopy. You need very little amount. So you may know of another technique that has revolutionized. Am I going for too long? No, please do. <laughs> <laughs> Getting to sick of listening to myself. But there is a technique that... I, um, I know very well because it was actually discovered or implemented by a colleague of Randy and I in Berkeley, Jennifer Doubtner. It has to do with genome engineering using CRISPR technology. So with CRISPR, you can engineer your genome, and for example, you can add a little handle to one of the proteins in these complexes um, and use that handle to pull them out of the cell. You don't have to ex, you know, produce them in large amount. Just grab onto something that is in the cell, and that's enough material, even if it's a very, very rare um, complex in the cell, to be able to do cryo-electron microscopy. But it, it's just not going to be possible to do crystallography because there's not enough material. So cryo-EM, uh, I wouldn't say that solves every problem, but it allows you to get to very large and flexible complexes that are what are doing all the, fun the functions that, are, um, that we are interested in in the cell. And now I'm going to be quiet for Thank you a so much. Patrick, you'd like to add to that? <laughs> yeah, maybe just uh, one thing that I could add. Um, I didn't have time to show it today, but our work that you mentioned on the coronavirus polymerase, the virus also has a polymerase. It's a baby polymerase, small one. But um, can you believe it, how interesting it was when people were already treated by uh, drugs like remdesivir or molnupiravir? These are antiviral drugs. People were already treated, but the exact mechanism was not known yet. And we were doing this work in the first year of the pandemic, and we could see for the first time how does this drug actually work, atom by atom, you know, and why is it a poor drug? Ah, because it escapes the recognition and so forth. So you get these insights. You know, people are treated, and they're fighting in the hospital with the virus, and you get the molecular insights. So that is very satisfactory because you think you can contribute that maybe you get a better drug. It may take a long time, and we're working on it, but uh, it, it's very satisfactory because you 
have a feeling like you know one day your work will actually help people who suffer. No. Thank you. Actually, you answer my second question, which is why do we need, know, need to know the structure and why do we need to understand so much detail about the transcription regulation, right? So in a way that you know, many uh, you know, uh, medical students uh, will say, why are you teaching us all these very detailed things, right? So I think in, that, in this case, you know, you're putting reason behind the importance of understanding details. So, uh, student, take note. <laughs> I, I can see that there's uh, eager hands out there. Uh, maybe we could begin that from process. A mature, from yes, a mature please. professor. Please, can someone give uh, a uh, microphone, please? Yes, I have a question for Professor Kramer. Although I don't really understand the uh, transcription proteins, but I saw your slide about the uh, uh, transcription factors involved in the different tissues, different organs. Now, there's a, there's a tumor called teratoma in which you have several different tissues growing in the same uh, tumor, uh, like uh, teeth, hair, uh, all sorts of different tumors. So have you done uh, studies on teratomas and the set of transcription factors involved? <laughs> Maybe they're t too heterogeneous. But uh, if you have seen it, uh, can you give us some uh, information, perhaps? <laughs> no, we have not studied that, but uh, it's a very good point, and that is um, that you, in the end you need to do single cell analysis. Yes. Because also every, as you know, every tumor and every patient is slightly different, right? And the deeper you dig, the more dif you, know, you can basically stratify groups, but in the end, uh, individual tumors for individual patients. And so um, I think the single cell analysis had, has advanced really dramatically. The first, we have done a little bit of work with uh, Richard Sandberg at uh, Karolinska in Stockholm together. And in the beginning, you know, when I first saw these data, I couldn't believe how noisy they are. There was hardly any signal, you know, from single cells. But now it's quite robust. It's, it's reproducible. And uh, you can also begin to see not only the levels of RNAs, but also uh, the synthesis rate. So, uh, you know, what is the activity of certain genes? And I think these methods can now be uh, used to study individual tumors even and uh, separate the cells and find out, you know, what is exactly the gene expression pattern in these different cells. And of course, proteomics is advancing also, so you may also look at the protein level now. But we haven't done such studies. Any questions from the secondary students? Uh, please, Randy. So I have to travel halfway around the world to ask my colleague a question, but uh, <laughs> this is addressed to Patrick as well. It boggles the mind to look at the complexity of this machinery in relation to the relatively more simple organization of the bacterial transcription yeah. machinery. I wonder if there's some lesson from evolution uh, of intermediates in this, uh, in this process, perhaps in archaeal transcription. Is that, is that a true intermediate or is it simply a parallel evolution from bacteria? Where, where, yeah. do, where do archaea fit in this scheme? You want to answer? Yeah, so for, for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with the difference between the systems, the uh, bacterial RNA polymerase and the, and the eukaryotic RNA polymerase uh, in its core, and Patrick knows better than anybody, look very similar. But but ultimately, you know, bacteria uh, polymerase has four subunits instead of 12. But most importantly, all of this PIC that, I was, that we were talking about in bacteria is limited to one sigma factor that does the job of finding the core promoter, opening the duplex, bringing the, the polymerase. So why would eukaryotes generate such a complicated system where there's so many genes, so many proteins that have to be expressed to then themselves do the transcription of, of everything else in the genome. And I think the idea is always that every time you are complexity and you are components, you have, one more, you, you have additional ways of regulating the process. And, you know, um, 
there has to be, you know, because the two systems are so very different, you go from one sigma factor to dozens of mm, gen proteins in general transcription uh, factors and from a simple to a much more complex polymerase. Is there something in the middle, something that gives us some idea of what has, how one system has, mm, how, how the evolution of the complex eukaryote existed and exists. And, you know, I, I'm not completely aware, I, I don't, normally archaea tend to be this kind of intermediary where it's something in between, you, you add com components but you have maybe um, fewer genes so that, you know, it, it's something intermediate. And I just, I think that it is the case also for the transcription process, but I, I do not know the details, uh, Patrick. But this is this is just I agree with with Randy. It's just puzzling how that complexity has exploded to allow uh, regulation. I mean, in Archaea, you have the you know the TF2B and the TF2E and the TBP so are already there. In kind Archaea. of in between, mm -hmm. yeah. And so. Archaea, I learned from Carolyn Luger the other day, have uh, have nucleosomes too. Yep. So. That's uh, another difference that may be representing some evolutionary intermediate. Yeah, yeah, and and this uh, again, this is this example where you know you have nucleosome, but you have a reduced number of, of histones, for example. So it's, it's um, yeah. Can, is there time for one more comment? Yeah, sentence? please, please. Yes. Because I agree with Eva, but what I wanted to say is, you know, in the beginning when we compared the bacterial from Seth Dars to the eukaryotic, we found that all the surface is different and the core is the same. Yeah. And I thought, you know, it has to have to do with regulation, but then when you now look back and you map all the factors, there's not a single spot on the polymerase that cannot be bound by some protein at some stage. And some of them, you know, even U1 SNRP, you know, Reinhard Luhrmann's U1 SNRP, even that can bind to polymerase. So it's also the co-evolution of chromatin transition, RNA processing events, export control of mRNAs. It's all these surfaces have evolved to coordinate these processes in, you know, higher cells. And um, I think one last sentence, when you think about evolution, you know, you could even say, yeah, the T7, it's a single polypeptide, can do it all. I think in evolution you give up function in order to allow for regulation. Then you bring the function back with an additional factor. So basically you have another gene which complements the lost function and that allows you to regulate. And that you do, you know, 1,500 times with all these different factors. That's the way I look at it. Perhaps I could follow up before that. Um, so, you know, we have nuclear polymerase, we have mitochondrial hmm. polymerase, right? So they're different. How do you see the evolution part of it, that, that yeah, place? The mitochondrial is exciting because it's not related to a bacterial polymerase, which you would think because of the endosymbiosis. It's related to a phage polymerase, which means that the bacteria that were taken up by the later eukaryotic cells to become a mitochondrion were actually infected by a phage. And since the phage polymerase is much better than the cellular, right, it's very strong, it, it finds the promoter itself, it never falls off and so forth. Then that's why still today in all our cells we have a phage-like polymerase, which is the mitochondria. Yes. Polymerase. Okay. Uh, so, uh, just one wild question <coughs> on, on aging. This is a, you, it's, it's got a very healthy process which is going on in our healthy cells, right? But when we go going older, the telomere is doing something with the chromatin or whatever. This is, of course, far-fetched. But that's, does it, whatever, uh, affect the process? Like you're saying, uh, uh, how, many, how fast it moves and things like that, you know? The polymerase or the, and other things, the folding and the function, structural function. I'm not sure if I'm missing uh, the question. I don't know whether you, you're thinking that the the loss of, of telomeres will affect. Can we have the microphone again? Transcription okay. of, of it, it, open chromatin. A wild question, and I'm just making telomere it's a, as a way of putting it. All right, 
but telomere that is all related to chromatin, as you right, rightly said, is important in regulation of the whole body as uh, mechanisms. And so uh, this, this aging process of the cells, whatever it means, in, does it affect the, 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 the kind of function that all you described? Actually, I'm not sure. Um, I think that when a cell ages, um, it's very hard to say, you know, which is the first process that goes wrong, because then, as a consequence, the whole system is perturbed. And so we don't know whether, at least I don't know that, um, I'm not in that field, whether transcription is amongst the first processes that are altered, or whether it's a consequence of changes in chromatin that I don't know. Any other questions from the audience? Please. So you mentioned that this complex and these dynamics happen in every single cell in the body and happen from yeast to human cells. Um, but you mentioned that two-point mutations in, I think it was Saga, only cause disease specifically in the brain. Mm -hmm. Is there a reason for why something so conserved would only affect the brain? Yeah. Yeah, so if you remember, the trap subunit is the one that has binding site for different uh, transcription factors. And this is where the specificity is, is coming from. So in this particular case, uh, we think that the, what is being affected are the surfaces in, 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 the, in the trap subunit that are able to engage with different factors. So there could be some spe specificity there that has to do with... Um, with a specific proteins that have to be upregulated during, during the process of, um, you know, development, neuro, uh, neurodevelopment. You know, but it, it, this is a very interesting question that you're asking because there are certain things, you know, where there's mutations that happen in the ribosome or something like that. And you will say, you know, this is such an incredibly conserved and required piece of machinery for every cell, and then it manifests itself in particular tissues. And this could be because they have a certain requirement of production of protein or production of mes messenger RNA um, to be particularly high for certain genes, and even dysregulating a general uh, mechanism can affect one more than the other. But in this particular case, I, I do believe that this is de deregulating. Um, you know, a specific uh, genes that have to do with this, uh, with this development, just because of where, where it is located. Kathy. Hi, that was a fantastic two lectures, really was. I've you have been to speak a bit louder. I've been fascinated by gene regulation for a very long time. Can you speak a bit louder, Kathy? But I've been fascinated by gene regulation for a very long time, but the, my studies have mostly been on the cellular tissue basis and not round to this resolution. But I guess, you know, it's amazing what you have found out from, I guess they're mostly reconstitutional, reconstruct, reconstitution, right? And, but we do know that, for example, the, in order to have gene regulation, you need to have the enhancer with its proteins bound and interacting with the promoter. So I wonder whether what you are doing now to try to see how would that affect PIC and all those other complexes when you have the enhancer coming? Mm -hmm. And how do you get then tissue specificity of expression? Yeah, no, it's a wonderful question because this is at the end, at the heart of the, of the transcriptional regulation process and how um, certain activities have to be recruited uh, to the promoter, maybe through activators that are binding an, an, in an enhancer, at an enhancer region, and what it is recruited and, and brought together. Um, by the way, this, um, the theme of, uh, of proximity of enhancer and promoter and the actual mechanism by which this genome activation occurs is a matter of super, super active debate. Uh, for people that are actually doing cellular work and using different mechanisms, you know, different techniques, whether they are uh, visualizing directly, labeling components of enhance and promote and seeing how they come together or not, or they're using um, other 
cross, you know, elements that involve cross-linking and, and, and other modes of m measuring proximity. But the whole idea is that, you know, the, the regulatory component, which is how, you know, you, you alter the chromatin state, how you open it, how uh, you uh, activate the, the polymerase through mediator, all of that has to do ultimately with uh, the activity, the, the presence of transcription factors that exist that are in the promoter or in enhancer regions. So yes, we, we're working with reconstituted systems. We are missing a certain dimension that has to do with exactly what you uh, are saying, but we believe that ultimately the mechanisms that have to do with forms of activation um, involve that you know, recruitment, a proximity of things that are able to say interact with complexes like, like Saga that then modifies nucleosome in the proximity of the core promoter, for example. I don't know if that's exactly, uh, is addressing your question. So, so I was just Patrick. wondering whether you tried to reconstitute in the presence of an enhancer with, so Patrick described some tissue specific transcription factors and whether that would actually alter your initiation complex, uh, whether you I had mean, tried anything like that. I mean, we did some of those studies. They're not published, and basically it's very difficult because the active region of an enhancer that has been known for decades is actually an intrinsically disordered region. So it's very difficult to visualize. Some people have visualized them, but it's then very short peptides, and you don't really understand what they're doing, they bind somewhere on the surface. But what we've done, we've used these functional genomics techniques, and you can look inside of living cells. Mm -hmm. And we can see how um, enhancers are cooperating in order, you know, we defined a protocol where we can measure the enhancer RNA that is produced from the enhancers. And we found that the enhancer activity is related to the synthesis rate of this enhancer RNA. And that allows you to genome-wide look for cooperating enhancers. And that is uh, really fascinating uh, because you see enhancers that are additive and those that are super additive, and we call them synergistic. Um, but the about the mechanism, how they actually work in the end, that is yet to come. Uh, but the reason why we define those three core mechanisms for regulation is that now you can look in cells because we can do the kinetics using mathematical modeling of the functional genomics or multi-omics data. You can look in cells which of those three mechanisms are actually targeted by which enhancer. And then you can also go down and look which protein factor which that is bound because enhancers bind multiple factors are actually targeting which of those regulatory processes. Then you don't understand the structural mechanism but you understand at least the mechanism because you know which of those processes is targeted by which transcription factor or which enhancer. And that can now be done because you can deplete those factors very rapidly from cells. Okay, we have a yeah, question from... It is, I think it's a question of um, whether the key to what you're asking really requires, you know, has a structural answer versus whether what is being generated is an increase in local concentration of set, certain factors um, that are promoted by this intrinsically disordered uh, region. So it is not necessarily an, a structure, um, you know, the, the link between mechanistic aspect, aspect that we can describe, that we are in the process of describing, and those enhancers just has to do with how much of these different factors um, that need to come together are brought to the region through just generating high local concentration, say, in, in these condensates or, or, or Okay, I, I or think hubs. we need to move on yeah. to a chance for okay. uh, one of the students to ask questions, please. Oh. Awesome. Have your discoveries changed how you see the world everyday life? <laughs> <laughs> so, I didn't get it, sorry. Yeah, so... Repeat the question. Have, have do we, see, do we see the world in a different way now that we have seen the structure of a pause? How have uh, your complex? discovery changed everyday life? <laughs> for example, your work with uh, COVID-2, yeah. for example. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the thing is that um, research is very incremental, right? You, 
uh, try things, it doesn't work, you try again and so forth, and eventually you may get a paper, or you may get your PhD, but very s seldom do you then see something that is called disruptive development. So you have the incremental science, right, and suddenly you have uh, something disruptive. So it was, for example, disruptive when the direct electron detectors were invented. And by the way, it was also um, recognized by a Nobel Award, Nobel Prize. So then you have this disruptive change, and then everybody can work in an incremental way again. And you, you have to look at your work as you know, contributing to this scientific global process. So has it changed uh, the world? Uh, some of it has. Uh, there's plenty of examples. Think of CRISPR, for example. Think about the pseudouridine modification that allows you to make a messenger RNA vaccine. Think about such recent examples in biomedicine. So those are dis disruptive uh, changes, and very few people in the world can make those discoveries. But they're actually based on a huge amount of knowledge that is generated in this incremental scientific progress where all of you can contribute. And then some of you may hopefully one day be able to do such a disruptive change. I think that's the way I look at science. So um, has it changed my personal world? Certainly, yes. When I look back, when I was your age, basically the, um, uh, all the proteins uh, were known, or most of them were known by the name, um, but nobody knew how they would look like. They were just the very first structures coming out. Um, TBP alone, I remember, I was seeing in the beginning of the 90s. Uh, so it certainly has changed so dramatically. Now we can make movies of the process. So there's two things that I want to point out, because it's very common that when we scientists interact with, you know, uh, um, general audience or with people that are not necessarily into science, we get asked, what is the use? What is the purpose? Uh, uh, what are you doing? What are you, what are you doing for me? What are you producing that changes my life? And I can, you know, the, uh, the answer could be, you know, we are generating the kind of information that is required, for example, to uh, create or improve therapeutic treatment of illnesses. But I want to emphasize that mm, it is very important to do science for science sake, to, you know, to be curious and describe and understand nature. In many cases, the practicality of that will come later, not being the motivation for doing the research, but once you understand things, you think, hmm, this could be maybe used for something, but what motivates scientists is curiosity. Look, we were, for these two days, we were interacting with astronomers. They are looking at things that have to do, you know, with very distant processes and the structure of the universe and things like that. How their knowledge is affecting your, your everyday life. Is it curing a disease? Is it making a form that can do more things than it does already? No, but are you not interested in knowing about how the universe is and how <laughs> things, you know, what are black holes and things like that? So it's part of the human experience to have this curiosity and to want to know. And in the case of biologists, we want to understand how we work, how we think, how we are alive. So um, yes, it will come that our kind of studies will be utilized, maybe not in a lab, but maybe a biotech, a pharmaceutical company will use it. But it's just, I just want you to be excited about you know, understanding nature, period. <laughs> because that has a lot of value of, of itself and it makes us human to have this curiosity. Very well said, thank you. Last question, perhaps, uh, Professor Lau. <laughs> <laughs> what, I, I know that it will have to be the last question and I'm very pleased to know, to see as a high school student actually asking a question and uh, very, good answers from our two esteemed speakers. So I hope that our students are actually inspired. I'm sure there's one question in them that they have not asked, and that is, how did you manage to you know, put all the things that you did in your laboratory and then configure you know, the various molecules and eventually make such a movie that you have just shown us, Patrick? I mean, to prepare these young people thinking ahead whether they want to be a scientist 
do they need to be artistic as well? Do they need to know how to make movies and how do you do it? <laughs> you know, every time we write a paper, I have to have a serious discussion with the student or the postdoc that is, has done the work about the colors in the figures because I think, you know, uh, there are certain details that are relevant for to, to even make yourself understood, we generate these animations. And to start with, I thought that animations were kind of frivolous. We're just making a movie because it just, nobody helps uh, understanding because you can, for example, see the motions that, uh, that Patrick was showing of the polymerase unraveling the nucleosome. And without that movie with the right colors to, to show it very vividly, we may be missing some of this information. So. If you have that kind of artistic talent, use it. It is wonderful to combine scientific knowledge with a way of expressing it uh, in a way that others will be receptive to it. It's just and, and causes even an emotional reaction to it. That's what I think, yeah. Yeah, it's entertaining people not by playing jokes, but by making people understand, and that gives you a lot of pleasure. And um, maybe, you know, what Eva said, that curiosity is something that makes us human. It's also that we uh, enjoy beauty, right? Somehow we, you know, it's very difficult to teach a computer what beauty is. It's very difficult. We have AI, but it's not so easy. But as humans, we see something, we, we find it beautiful, right? And even maybe across generations, it, everybody would say even across nations, this is beautiful. And I think that is also part of the motivation to convey this idea of beauty in nature, which is also there at the atomic and molecular level. Okay, I think we've running out of time. So thank you so much, Eva and Patrick, for this wonderful Sorry. discussion. And thank, thank you. you, everybody, for asking questions. Uh, this closes the Q&A section. I'll pass the mic back to our MC. Thank you very much, Professor Chang. <laughs>